They apparently need to put like chalk or markers or something down on, down on the floor. So uh, I, I nail the placement of my uh, my green screen <laughs> because there's always a there's always a fuss without it. I should I should I should just know that when uh, I get it uncomfortably close to uh, my back, that's when it's in the right place. Should move over a little bit, right? Uh, should try to act professional a little bit for once in my life. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to talk about UDF inlining, and it's a it's a it's a topical topic. It's a very topical topic because SQL Server uh, cumul cumulative update number five. Oh, we have a follower. You're so good at following. Cumulative update number five for SQL Server 2019 dropped. And we got a whole bunch of, well, actually not a whole bunch. We got a few more restrictions on um, the type of functions that can be inlined, or rather w what we can do inside of functions that allows them to be inlined. Um, I don't know how many people right now might currently be on SQL Server 2019 in production, not just like fooling around and testing stuff, but like live and prod, go crazy, getting up in there, joining the future. Can you imagine if Microsoft had released uh, a SQL Server 2020 with everything else going on. Can you imagine <laughs> the nightmare that, that that version would be? It would be insane. It would be absolutely insane. Only Stack Overflow. Yeah, they, they might be. They might be the only ones. But I don't know. I see I see questions on Stack Exchange um, about SQL Server 2019 where it seems like people have either gone live or started new development with uh, SQL Server 2019 because there have been several questions about issues with UDF inlining. Settle for SSMS dark theme. Wow. Yeah, that'd be nice. It, uh, see, I love the idea of dark theme, but... Oops, I opened the wrong window. <laughs> I love the idea of dark theme, but then sort of like in practice, if we crack open... Oh, it's right at the top. I don't need to go... I don't need to go start hunting for it. Eventually, it'll open up. And also, I'm, I'm a bad person because I did not up, up I did not upgrade to 18.5.1.3333. I am still on 18.5.1.3330 like or something. So there's a couple things with uh with dark mode. One is I I do tend to present about SQL Server from time to time. And uh, I'm told that uh, dark mode when presenting uh, will present some difficulties. So, so people not sitting way up front or without awesome super eagle eye vision sometimes have difficulty seeing um, you know, some weird interference on the, the green screen over, over here. I wonder what it is. Wonder what just changed. I don't know. I have no idea. But uh, I'm told that when presenting, dark mode can be weird. And the other thing about dark mode for SSMS is like the amount of places, the amount of places where you would have to apply dark mode would be pretty fantastic. So like you would have to have uh, it over here and over here, and then like you know if you just select from uh, sys dot uh, we'll do sys dot messages I like sys dot messages for everything if we look at sys dot message like you would have to have like all this in dark mode there would be like a lot of a lot of places where um, where you would have to apply dark mode and a lot of like just I don't know like I don't know how I would handle this pain in dark mode uh, let's see, Jeremy says, that name is cool in Spanish. Yes, uh, my, my friend Carlos Robles, uh, Robles I, I'm, I'm, I always, but I'm terrible at, at pronouncing anything. It's, it's, not, it's not out of ignorance. It is just out of having a mush mouth. 
but my friend Carlos Robles, Robles or some Robles, I believe, uh, also loves my <laughs> my, my weird uh, semi-Spanish uh, server names. But yeah, like it, like to get like all like the right all the right stuff and like all the right dark mode things in the right places, it would just be be a hassle. <laughs> like I don't know what I would want here. Uh, there was a way of enabling it. Yeah, so, yeah, but you could enable it, but I want to say that you could only enable it for, like, up here, for, like, the code pane. I'm not sure that even with the the dark mode hack that you're talking about, I might be wrong, because I never, I never tried it because it looked like crap, but, uh, it, like, I, I, I don't know if it applied to this or in this. I think it might have only applied to the coding pane. I just don't, I don't recall the details. You, you can correct me if I'm wrong there. I don't, I'm not pretending to be yeah, half the windows just didn't. <laughs> it's it's coming back to me now. It's coming back to me now. Uh, so yep, the text editor can be dark. The results for yeah. So like that would be very troubling to me <laughs> if I was just like typing away in dark mode and I'm like if I run the queer then like blinding and like the, like like think about like that. Think about that one step further. How would we? How would we have? Uh, dark mode execution plans like like dark mode execution plans would have to like i don't know i i don't even i don't even know what would happen here it would be insane dvac says i hate dark theme uh you know i like it okay for some i don't you know, you know maybe not dark theme uh i i think when i'm typing notes for myself i like sort of a darkish gray background and like sort of like a muted white text so it's not like glaring at me, but uh, like regular dark mode stuff, like you you might see for like, um, I don't know, uh, like like Visual Studio or something like that has never appealed to me all that much. I don't know. Let's see. SSMS by now is probably untouchable. Spaghetti and the devs are avoiding to touch it like the plague. Yes, yes and no. Uh, I mean, they do release updates for it, but I can't I can't imagine. Well, I mean, I guess I could, because new, newer versions of SQL Server 2000, or <laughs> newer versions of SSMS, not of SQL Server, newer versions of SSMS um, supposedly use uh, Visual Studio Shell, huh? something like that. Uh, Sentry 1 does it in, in the ADS add-on. Yeah, uh, I, I just, you know, I, I don't care much for ADS, even with the Planix, like the, the Sentry 1 plugin to get, like, Plan Explorer stuff in there. It, it's just not not my cup of tea. I've I've tried. Let's see, uh, Khalil, you're absolutely welcome. It's my pleasure. I I, I enjoy doing these things. It get, so like you know, uh, I've been blogging for a while, and I, while I enjoy I enjoy writing blogs, um, you know, it's sometimes it's tough to to just sit and write things. Sometimes it's more fun to. Uh, to you know, record a video, or you know, go live like this because you know, it's you know when you write a blog post, it's it's a lot of words <laughs> and like thinking about words and like taking screenshots and making sure you have the right screenshots and all this other stuff. I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. Evac says Twitch kept buffering, so I came to YouTube and there's no problem. Eh, I don't. So Twitch, uh, you know, you're not the first person to say that, and uh, I'm not really not really sure what the issue is. I've hit. Uh, issues with Twitch buffering and stuttering both at like the very beginning of a live stream and like then in the middle and I, I just don't know what to do. I like, I just think occasionally Twitch comes un under a little extra load and well whatever magic robots they have that like scale things up or out or you know move people around so that they things get rebalanced uh, however long it takes that to kick in just I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to, I wish I had more control over that unfortunately I am in the cloud and I am on someone else's computer. And <laughs> you know what they say about other people's computers? Don't touch the keyboard. <laughs> you don't know what the, you don't know about those people. You don't know what they do at night. You don't know. Oh, weird! My can of seltzer is like semi chroma keyed. That's very odd. It's like not like in real life. It's not that big a deal. I thought was it like the ref no? It's not the reflection. I don't know. Something weird is up with my can of seltzer. That wasn't like a paid sponsor thing either. Uh, I just I just love seltzer. 
Seltzer is about my favorite thing in the world. My favorite, probably my favorite non-alcoholic beverage. A nice, nice, crisp, tongue-burning bubble seltzer. But uh, anyway, let's uh, let's get into things a little bit. Uh, sort of the same deal as yesterday. Uh, if you are interested, this Friday, so not, wait, what's today? Is today Tuesday? Whew, today is Tuesday, so I have a few more days. Oh, where'd you go? Don't be a jerk. <laughs> so today is Tuesday. Slideshow. Uh, today is Tuesday. So on Friday, June the 26th, starting at 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we're starting at 10 a.m. Eastern because originally it was supposed to be my sequel Saturday Chicago Precon. I'm going to be wrestling with the slideshow. You know what? Screw it. Uh, I was originally supposed to be my sequel Saturday, Saturday, sequel Saturday Chicago Precon. So there's a lot of folks from uh, the, the, the Middle West uh, attending, and I don't want them to have to wake up at 8 a.m. to learn about sequel servers. So we're starting at 10 a.m. Eastern to be more accommodating to our friends in the Middle West. Mike says, is that like lemonade? Uh, so this is lemon lime seltzer, which I'm not crazy about. I prefer just plain Jane, regular, unflavored seltzer. Uh, un you know, I mean, say unfortunately, but we've been ordering d ordering groceries a lot more <laughs> for obvious reasons uh, rather than going to the store. And sometimes, you know, you place an order with, you know, uh, whatever service and they come and they like you know you you check you like you check the box of like substitute if they don't have the exact thing which a lot of times they, they take some like pretty you know pretty like pretty big advantage of. <laughs> so like like pick out another plain seltzer cool but then like they'll also pick out like a flavor of seltzer rather than plain and it's just like it's a little bit much so you know but they show up with it and you don't want to be like you know <laughs> you lugged four cases of of lemon lime seltzer here <laughs> I'm gonna make you take it back. So I I I I grin and bear it, but it's not my favorite thing in the world. It's this one's lemon lime. It's okay. You, after a while, you 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 learn to forget. But uh, oh yeah, so Friday, uh, live in person. Um, if you want to join us for a full day of SQL Server query tuning, uh, you can buy tickets over yonder. Uh, if you use the coupon code PagerDuty. Um, I forget. Oh, so that, that was that made a lot more sense yesterday. I'm just lazy and didn't feel like making a different one for today. But if you want to join us, the 75 bucks off that brings the cost down to 125 uh, US dollars for a full day of SQL Server performance tuning. And of course, if you sign up, you get access to every single second of all of the video training that I currently have available. So. Mike says, I had a substitution of apples for carrots this week. That is not even... That's unreasonable. That is completely unreasonable. The art, uh, that, that, is, that is beyond the pale. Especially if you're on uh, a, like, uh, a, a diet that requires you to stay away from cars. Because apples, sort of surprise. Like, I mean, I mean, depending, on, depending on how, like, how keen you are on nutrition, tr nutrition things, apples have about 20 grams of carbs in each apple there's 20 grams of tw 20 grams of car carbs in like a normal sized apple carrots do not have that problem so if you're on uh keto or uh i don't know i don't know i don't know i actually i don't know how paleo hand i know that paleo allows carbs if you're on keto or some other specialized diet then apples you just can't have them they're all sugary and carby and stuff do not they do not they do not achieve the same goal as a carrot So whatever. I was very excited though. Yesterday, uh, yesterday uh, went out and uh, our, our favorite neighborhood restaurant was open. Was letting people eat out, eat, and, eat and drink outside. So we went went to a restaurant for the first time in three months. I was very excited about that. So she says, "Why can't they just call?" I don't know. <laughs> it's bonkers, right? It's absolutely bonkers. But uh, I don't know. Whatever. Guessing just overworked and under bothered. Yeah, it could be. It could very well be very well be but it, it's you know I mean you know you you have sympathy because they're uh, they're out there doing a, a tough job uh, doing a tough job because um, we're not allowed to go all the places that we used to be allowed to go to and 
you know, they're they're taking a, they're taking a lot more risks than a lot of other people are. Uh, so you know, yeah, have some some sympathy and empathy or whatever, whatever other whatever pathies allow you to understand other people and go from there. So uh, I think we have probably enough enough people. We're about I don't know about 15 minutes past the hour, so we'll get started talking about functions because that's what that's what I advertised, right? That's what I what I said that we would be learning about today. So we're gonna do that, and let me just see if there's anything. Ooh, there is some Twitter activity. Yes, uh, cool. See in ten minutes. Ba, 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 ba. Awesome. Yes, we are good. We are good to go. All right. So SQL Server 2019. Oh well, we'll get the access to training videos. Our lifetime. Nope, that is for lifetime. For your entire life, uh, I do not have a subscription service now. You get it forever and ever. Um, but that, like, so, but uh, you know, as new stuff comes in, that wouldn't be included. That's just sort of everything for what I have now. But it's a, still a pretty good deal. Still a pretty good deal. Still about a thousand, th about a thousand bucks worth of training material in there for a pretty low price. And you don't even have to show up Friday. You can just, you know, you can just say that you're going to show up Friday pay for the ticket and you can still get the videos. And I, I, will, I will never tell a soul. I'll be totally okay with that. So we're going to talk about uh, Scalar UDF inlining uh, because this is, of course, uh, one of the cool new optimizer features in SQL Server 2019. And I might get sued for having this picture of uh, uh, this, this screen cap from Drumline <laughs> in here, but whatever. You call your lawyers. This is all for free. And uh, this is the lovely gentleman who uh, who spearheaded the the project and effort um, to get to start solving this ma this massive massive problem in databases, right? This is a, this is a fellow named Karthik. I've never met Karthik. We 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 we've exchanged emails and we've exchanged twitters. I am a very big fan of his, though. He, he has done great work, uh, and you know, scalar UDFs are just such a huge problem in databases. Uh, I like. <clears throat> I want like probably ninety percent of the clients that I work with week after week have problems with scalar valued functions, uh, and like there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can approach tuning queries around them. That's something that I'm definitely going to be going in depth on in depth on on Friday. T the purpose of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today is just kind to kind of go into, you know, uh, how SQL Server 2019 does with it, like how some of the uh, autom like how some of the autom automatic stuff works and uh, you know some of the issues you might run into when if you move to 2019 and your uh, functions start getting in line. Uh, daughter isn't keen on changing her name. I don't know. Karthik is a fantastic girl's name. You should, I think if you just start calling her Karthik, it might stick. <laughs> Uh, so the problem that we've always had in SQL Server, the problem, the problem that we've run into year after year, day after day, decade after decade, is that developers come from uh, backgrounds where portable code, don't repeat yourself, you know, DRY, DRI, whatever it is, uh, they want that sort of code portability. And th basically the only way to achieve that in a database is to write it as a function. Now we didn't always have access to inline table valued functions. Uh, for a, a long time, uh, we had all uh, these scalar UDFs, and we had you know the multi-statement table valued functions, and then we had, had inline table valued functions, and just keep, like well, 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 like these things got introduced into the product, there wasn't a lot of education around like this is bad, <laughs> like, this, like why they're bad, things like that, and you know it 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 really didn't become a terribly imperative issue until SQL, until like, you know, a lot of SQL servers started running on multi-core systems where queries were going, you know, parallel massively, or at least had the ability to go massively parallel. Because one of the, the real big downsides of scalar valued functions is that they force the query that calls them to run serially. You can't use multiple cores when SQL server calls a scalar valued function. There's all sorts of weird stuff that goes on, like aside from that, where the function can run once per row rather than once per query. But like, more like, like you know, the, probably like the main drawback is that you might have some like big honking reporting query that does a ton of work 
But then, you know, you throw a function in there to, like, even do something as simple as, like, format a date to some specific thing. And you end up with your big honking reporting query running serially because functions are terrible. <sighs> and it was very, very difficult and misleading looking at execution plans that have functions in them to really figure out where things might have gotten slow. It's like, like functions hide a lot of work because they just get stuck away in a compute scalar operator. You don't see all the stuff that a function does. And a lot of people would just, you know, blame sort of other unreasonable metrics like, oh, the PLE is low or oh, the indexes are all fragmented or, you know, whatever else it was today. <laughs> like, oh, the server's full of bobcats again. It's, you know, this, like, any, it could be like anything, right? Just any sort of crazy thing might happen. And, uh, you know, uh, we as performance tuners have seen the issues with functions for years now years actually like decades now <laughs> seen them for decades and uh for a very long time people have been begging microsoft for a solution and for years microsoft just thoroughly ignored all of us for years microsoft was just like just stop using them or do something else <laughs> they were very blasé about it it was it was, it was very little like response it's like, like, they're like, yeah, I, I mean, we can't go look at Connect now. I, I wish that, like, if, if anyone out there works for Microsoft and can low key get me a dump of the old Connect site with all the issues, I would love you forever because not all of them made it over to the new user voice site. And there was a lot of really valuable comments from the developers of SQL Server on some of those Connect issues that, like, were great references for people. And none of those made it over to the new uh, user voice site. Uh, and it would be really nice to have that. So if anyone out there works for Microsoft and can get me a dump of the old Connect site, I won't tell a soul, I won't publicize it, I will just have this nice thing that I can reference and look at and, and read when I go to sleep at night. But yeah, there, so there are like a number of things on the Connect site. There were, uh, there were always things... Uh, you know, like it, questions on the internet, like why get, why are functions slow? Why are they bad? Like, <laughs> what's going on here? And then of course Microsoft invented this thing called Azure. And as, I, I think pretty much as soon as Azure started getting some traction and they started like, um, they started seeing some, some user databases in Azure that weren't named AdventureWorks. Uh, as soon as they started getting like some, some like, you know, actual workloads in there and started seeing just how like, like in like bad and intense, like there's like the awful ways that scalar valued functions can like drag queries through the garbage. Then I think they were like, Karthik, get over here. <laughs> We got to do something about this. We 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 got to fix the functions. They're really screwing us up. All those CPUs that we bought, they're running at 100%. <laughs> Please fix it. And so we we ended up with this thing called Freud, which is the optimization of imperative programs in a relational database. And it was, of course, uh, you know, we had we had Karthik and a number of other people, including this this his handsome fella. Who I, who I met once, who, who likes chocolate chip cookies, who if, if Connor Cunningham ever solves a database problem for you, you should send him chocolate chip cookies. I don't have his address, and I'm not going to dox Connor, but if, if, you, if you're ever on a support thread and Connor is on it and Connor solves your problem, ask him where to send the chocolate chip cookies. He will appreciate you. And I love this idea. I love this idea. Uh, because uh, it is a major step forward in just having a less crappy database and having a database with just like one less mine you can step in, right? Databases are full of those mines. Uh, databases are, you know, just such weird, tricky implementation specific uh, fields of <laughs> bloody limbs <laughs> that uh, it's just one of the, like one of those things where like, thank God they did something because the status quo on functions just sucked for a lot of people. And, you know, it didn't matter how simple your function was, how complex it was. It always had sort of the same few basic side effects, which you could, of course, exacerbate by making them bigger and more complex, but whatever. So uh, I love this thing. But there are some edge cases where things with the uh, with uh, scalar valued scalar UDF inlining that you can hit they, like when the rewrite happens internally with the optimizer, <clears throat> you can run into some issues. And there are a bunch of limitations. And rather than show you this slide, so <clears throat> this is this is this is from a deck that I cover much later. 
uh, in my pre-con material. Uh, so I cover like the, the limitations a little bit more fully earlier in the day uh, with UDF inlining, but <clears throat> uh, that slide is there just as sort of a reminder. But the, re the, the reason why I'm working through these today specifically is because uh, SQL Server uh, 2019 had cum cumulative update five released and CU5 uh, not only introduced some new things that got uh, that nerfed UDF inlining, but they also, but it also resulted in a KB article that sort of more specifically documented things. So uh, in CU2, um, there were a whole bunch of fixes and um, some restrictions added to UDF inlining uh, down here. I think those are. Yeah, so CU2 had, had a couple, and, and then CU4, we had a few more, and then in CU5, we have a few more here. So this is kind of like, this is how much of a weird scrub I am. I didn't know that a UDF could have multiple return statements in it. I didn't know that. I'm going to have to, I, now I, like later I'm going to go figure out exactly what that looks like. Um, so yeah, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, they're, they're slowly nerfing. Um, Brent joked on Twitter earlier that by the time we get to CU9, we might not even have UDF in lining. So, <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. I mean, you know, there's really, uh, really probably only, only so much you can control before. <laughs> you just have to pull the plug on something. But yeah, so the reason why I'm doing this today is because, of course, uh, we had some new stuff added that, that further nerfed it. So let's go look at some weird edge cases of functions. Uh, let me make sure that my other VM is up and running and ready. It looks like it. All right. Prep that a little bit. Switch this over. Where are, there's demos. Yay. Yay, I fixed it. You know what, I gotta put this down a little bit. There we go. I was I was strangely out of frame on that. Contact your system administrator. <sighs> I'm scared of my system administrator. It's a big n drunk knucklehead with tattoos. And Mr. Pichal says, "Is that like returns in a case statement?" Uh, no, not that I, not that I. No, I think you're th maybe thinking about things a little bit differently than what uh so like we'll we'll we'll, we'll get to like a scalar valued function example I and mean, we'll we'll try to puzzle out uh how the heck actually you know what maybe wait you know what we can do that now let's scroll down a little bit because now, now i'm just kind of interested now i'm just like sort of fascinated so let's see here let's take this function which we're gonna look at some stuff with uh and let's see if we can stick just another return in here. So let's just let's just put two of these in. <laughs> let's see what happens. Huh? Oh my God, that created successfully, but there's no way this is gonna work, right? Select. Uh, let's see what happens. I'm <laughs> fascinated now. I'm, I have no idea what's gonna happen here. Uh, and let's do. Uh, well, I know. John Skeet, it's 22656. Let's see what happens. And we only get one result. Hmm. Let's see. Uh, maybe we can do, you know, let's try something a little bit simpler. Select one. Select two. And let's. <laughs> Create it all do this and let's see what happens. Okay, so that selects one. So let's try, I don't know. Um, if at user ID not equal to two two five six turn if user ID equals two two six five six. I bet this is bet this is uh, what is this? The last statement included within a function will be returned. It is, isn't it? Huh. Weird. Yeah, I'm not sure about that now. Yeah, yeah return. That, that is a return. Hmm. 
All right. Well, you know what? That's about as much time as I'm I'm willing to spend on that. So let's let's get into the actual demos. All right. So I already I should have already created these indexes. That should still be good. Yes, yes, yes. So let's talk now about scalar UDF inlining. All right. We'll talk about the good stuff. So we're going to start with this function up here. This function is uh, I don't know one that I I like I like quite a bit because it is pretty simple. And it does something pretty realistically reasonable. Let's line those up. My OCD kicked in a little bit. Uh, so this is pr like pretty pretty reasonable. Does something pretty reasonable. It's just going to go out to the uh, to to a couple tables in the Stack Overflow database. It's going to go out to the post table and get a sum of your of someone's scores from the post table. And then it's going to do the exact same thing for the comments table. And it's going to add those two things together. So we're going to give you like the total score of all your posts and all your comments. And I know that like score works a little bit differently. You don't actually get reputation for comments, like you know, it's it, like they're two, two two different things. But just you know, as far as like you know, a function that has to go out and like do something like a little bit aggregate aggregatey, uh, I think this is a pretty good example. Um, I've seen sort of similar things um, on client systems, but you know, it's the Stack Overflow scheme. It's pretty simple, and coming up with like you know a really realistic like representation of that would be like just re like overly complicated so i just try to keep like this is just sort of like a simple thing so the first thing we're going to do is look at the query plan that we get with this function uh Mike Jim says, is it an SSMS add-on? You've got printing the completion time and messages. No, uh, that is a the default behavior in newer versions of SSMS. So I think it was 18.4, I think they added it. Um, but yeah, it's it's just built in. And I think a lot of people complained about it because, you know, if you go, <laughs> like if you're doing demos like this and you're recording them, and, you know, maybe you don't want to have your material look terribly dated, but then you have, like, you know, every query you run, you have a completion message. So it's like, it's maybe great for end users to be like, I'm not, I'm like, I'm not watching this. It's five years old. But, you know, for, um, for presenters who maybe want their, their videos to have a little bit more shelf life, uh, having <laughs> completion time in there is, um, well, you know, can be, like, it, like it, that should be, like, opt-in behavior, maybe, something like that, right? should be. Maybe something that like you know you, you don't just get, but yeah it's it's nothing I'm doing. So let's look at the query plan. So we have uh, this this query here. We're gonna do we're gonna do the select over here, and we're gonna do a select over here. But that's sort of not really the point. The point is that we have this total score function uh, called in this select list, and when we run this query in compat level 140, we get the estimated execution plan. Yes, you do need to update, Mike. Uh, I don't know what version of SSMS you're on, but you are missing a lot of good stuff in 18. Dot whatever. Well, actually, I don't even know what you might be. If you're on like 17.9, I'm concerned. But if you're on like one of the newer 18s, uh, like I forget which which SSMS it was, but there was one that just like I mean, there's I mean, the, <laughs> there was one that had a ton of bugs in it. They all have a ton of bugs in it. But they fixed a bunch of bugs in one of the newer SSMSs. But uh, so couple things about scalar valued functions in uh, like pre-2019. One is that we, if we got the actual plan for this, we wouldn't be able to see what the function is doing. The function would just be hidden away in one of these compute scalars. I forget which one it is in this plan. If we look at the properties, uh, nope, it's not that one. It should be... Yeah, so it's in this one. So if we look at the properties of this, we can see, let's zoom in so that human beings can read this stupid tiny print. This is where, this is the compute scalar where that total score uh, calculation happens. So we don't see the what the body of the function does in this plan. And this is one of those things I was talking about that sort of makes life difficult for query tuners because things get hidden away in this compute scalar operator. You don't see the full work that a function is doing. But if we get the estimated plan, we can see what SQL Server thinks the body of the function will look like. The reason why this doesn't make a lot of se why it doesn't make sense to show the execution plan for a scalar valued function in an actual execution plan is because of something that I mentioned earlier. Scalar valued functions execute once per row, not once per query. Each row could have a slightly different execution plan. 
if you return a query that has ten, like you know, that returns five, ten, twenty thousand rows, you would possibly be looking at five, ten, twenty thousand execution plans for the function because that function would have to say execute row, execute row, execute row. If you go and dig into something like profiler or extended events to look at like when like co completed queries, you would see just you would see all the calls out to the function. I'm not going to go into that here because it's not really what this this uh, particular module is about, but it is something that you can track. You can it is something you can verify that functions do execute once per row. So when the est when the estimated plan and it does make a little bit more sense to be able to show what the body of the function does. And you can, we're going to talk about a couple different side effects of functions and how they don't actually apply to the function itself. So the first thing is that the scalar valued function itself will, uh, will end up doing this to the query. We'll get this warning that we couldn't generate a valid parallel plan. Right, so SQL Server will tell us, like, even if I wanted to go parallel, I wouldn't be able to because you've got that function in there. We don't get the we don't get the like explicit reason for the lack of parallelism. Like we like SQL Server doesn't say, doesn't say cannot generate valid parallel plan without a single space. Like there are lots of other things in in like the SSMS output that has spa that have spaces in them. For some reason, cannot generate valid parallel plan. No one could find a space bar for that. So we get a non parallel plan. It's a parallel plan. So that's really nice, right? Good good job, developers. <laughs> so we don't get the explicit reason, but uh, I'm teaching you that this is a side effect of scalar valued functions. This is not something that I am just guessing at. This is, this is a known fact about them. But so that applies to the query that calls the function. That doesn't apply to the body of the scalar valued function. So within the body of the function, this can go parallel. And this will tie into something that we talk about a little bit in a little bit uh, when it comes to column store indexes. But the body of the function is allowed to go parallel. So we can see the kind of general plan shape that SQL Server uh, will use when this thing goes off and runs. We will scan these two clustered indexes and we will gather streams and then we will aggregate to get the total score sums and add those together. And uh, we will do that once per row. And we can see in the query plan itself, we can see we hit the users table. We do a nested loops join to badges and we do uh, a nested loops to the votes table because that's what we're doing up here, right? So we have uh, those two little, th we have those two subqueries in the select list here, but then the total score function is what's responsible for going out to posts and comments. So let's flip the compat level now to 150. And if you were in, uh, if you were in the live stream that I was doing, uh, I think one last week about indexes, you'll, you might, you might see what's coming here. And now if we get the estimated plan for this, we can see now in the execution plan where that function goes out and touches posts and comments. So this is now in the execution plan because the scalar valued function got inlined. The, the whole meaning, the whole purpose behind inlining is that the function is no longer just a black box that the optimizer just says, I don't know what's going to happen here. I'm going to run you. I might like it. I might not like it, but I'm not going to, I'm not really going to make it obvious what happened with the function getting inlined. It's just like if you had this, if you just like, just like if you had this syntax in a view or an inline table valued function, not the crappy multi statement table valued function that returns a table variable, but the one that just returns a select. So if you had like, you know, one of those things in here, that you would see something similar. But if you're in talking, if you're in one of my index live streams last week, you would know all about the evilness that is an eager index spool. Yeah? Terrible, terrible horribleness. It is an eager index pool. We do not like these. Uh, we are not fond of eager index pools. I, I went and clicked on the wrong thing. I wanted to go down here. But uh, we can look at what these eager index pools are doing, just like we talked about last week. And we can see that we are outputting a column called score and that we are seeking to, of course, for the post table, it's going to be the column user ID, which if we dig far enough into here, we'll see. And for the uh, for the comments table, we're going to be, again, outputting score. And then we're going to be seeking into a column just called user ID in this one, because for some reason, the, gene, the, the very, very smart people behind Stack Overflow, um, in the post table, there is a column called owner user ID. But in every other table, it's just user ID. I don't know why. I don't know why. So if you were in 
talking about indexes with me last week, then you probably remember the stuff that I talked about with these eager index spools, how they read the entire uh, table to, to the right of them, right? The, 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 the table that is a child operator to the index spool, they read the entire thing. So in this case, that's 17 million rows from posts, and it will be uh, 24 and a half million rows from comments. Takes all those rows, builds an index on with a key column of, well, for posts, it's going to be owner user ID, and with an included column of score. And then for uh, the comments table, come on, tooltip, come on back to me, it builds an, it builds an index object of, off in TempDB on user ID, so the, the user ID column in comments, and, it, and the, an included column of score. And uh, it'll, it'll build that index every single time we run this query and then throw things away. And this is what happens when UD, well, this is, sorry, this is not what, this can happen when UDF inlining kicks in. And this can happen because the optimizer will, when it has to inline things, it starts doing all sorts of things with cost-based optimization that it just might not do within the body of a function. So when the f that function gets inlined into the plan, SQL Server starts looking at it and going, oh boy, I, I, I got to do some work. Now. I got to think about how I want to do this. It, you know, and when you, um, when you call a scalar valued function prior to 2019 when there's no inlining, SQL Server doesn't really treat it like it's going to execute once per row. Uh, with or well, it doesn't it doesn't really do a good job of thinking like okay oh I'm gonna have to estimate this or I'm gonna have to execute this thing 20 million times, that's 20 million separate executions of the function. So it wouldn't even do any good to build an index spool within that because you would build 20 like if you return to 20,000 rows you would have built 20,000 index spools and that's kind of crazy right? That's kind of bonkers. That's probably not a good idea. So uh, it, the optimizer ha does have to think about what these functions are doing differently. In, the, in, the, in this case where you know, we would you know, be returning, I forget how many rows come back, but all of a sudden the optimizer is like, oh, we have to, <laughs> we're gonna have to run this nested loops join. How many times? Yeah, I think, I think, I think I'm gonna want an index, I think I'm gonna want an index to help me. And so if we create a couple indexes that match the definitions of those spools, we can actually get uh, you know, pretty close performance between the non-inline version and the inline version. So I'm going to create uh, indexes on the post table and owner user ID include score, on the comments table on user ID include score, and we're going to we're just going to create those so we can we can watch what happens without the uh, the index spooling and with proper indexes in place. So we'll alter the database and we're going to set compat level back to 140. So that's the 2017 level, so there's not going to be any UDF inlining here. And when we run this query, we get the actual plan, we're not going to see the, the body of the UDF anymore, right? When we got the estimated plan, we were able to see the body. But when we look at the actual plan, all we're going to see is that we touched users, we touched votes, and uh, over here a little bit, we touched badges, right? We don't see that we called out to posts and comments. C even more tricky, I think, right? If we go and we say set statistics time IO on, right? Oops, <laughs> on. There we go. If we run this and we look at the and we look at the output from uh, stats time and I/O, we're not going to see anything in here about touching posts or comments either, right? If we go over to the messages tab and we look at what I/O we did, we have a work table, we have votes, we have badges, we have users. We don't have anything about posts and comments over here. All the work that went into that scalar valued function executing happens at the compute scalar. So up until we hit that compute scalar, this query, like there was one second of CPU execution duration leading up to this compute scalar, right? So that, that 1.011 seconds over there is just like if you added up all of the operator times going from right to left until we hit that sort. And then we had another about, what, 2.7 seconds of execution time in the compute scalar. Troubleshooting scalar valued function stuff gets a lot easier on more modern versions of SQL Server when you're working with more modern versions of SSMS because you get this operator time stuff and things that never used to stick out as being a problem now kind of sti have, can, can stick out a little bit more as being a problem. So this compute scalar that runs for 2.7 seconds, you're like, wow, you're doing a lot of work. What the heck are you up to in there? We go look at the properties and we can see that that is going to be... Uh, where that function is hidden away, right? So that's where our total score function is hidden. And then 
if we uh, flip the compat level back to 150 and we go and look at the exact same thing, just with function inlining turned on, we're going to get a slightly different execution plan, right? So this one's a little bit different. This execution plan goes parallel. Uh, the other that that other query that other query that we saw that would not be able to go parallel because we're in 2017. But this one here is able to go fully parallel, right? So we do all sorts of parallel stuff, and in this one we can we we get a little bit more honesty about what happened. And one of the things that I really like about UDF inlining, whether it's something that is like we do as part of a manual rewrite, or whether it's something that SQL, you know you go to SQL Server 2019 and it starts kicking in, one thing that I like is that you just get a little bit more honesty about what your functions might be up to behind the scenes. So in this one, this one we can see that we touch posts and comments. If we come over to the uh, stats IO tab, we can see posts and comments right here. We can see whatever work we did. And you know, just being able to go parallel, uh, you know, having the function in line, we get, we get slightly better performance over here. So that is a pretty nice thing. So rule number one of, what rule number one I think of Freud is that it, it, Freud, when you start inlining functions, you can seriously expose poor indexing. Uh, stuff that didn't come up before as a performance issue with functions, or at least like within the body of the function, might start showing its face when we uh, get to 2019 and the functions start getting inlined a little bit differently. Uh, if, we, if you, if you uh, run 2019 and you start seeing functions with index bools in the plan, um, then you will probably start seeing, and you start seeing those index bulls, and you, you know, we have some indexing work to do. Uh, Mr. P. Shaw says, does it work on functions in the where? Uh, yes, it can inline those, but uh, you did not get very good guesses for cardinality estimates. And, um, well, you know what, let's just, let's go look in the, in the, in an example. Uh, let's see. So I, that was actually one of the next demos that I had. So let's set this, uh, let's see, do I want this in? Yeah, I want this at 150. So let's make sure that we're back at 150. And let's clear out the plan cache. And let's go look at, oh, you know what? I, I forgot to show you this. Um, this is what the inlined, inline version of the function would have looked like before we, oh wait, I did show this, before we created indexes. No, I didn't show this, I showed the estimated plan. Each one of these index pools would take about a minute and a half to build. That's a pretty significant amount of time. Like, like anything that we did prior was pretty short. And then when we get up to here, uh, we spend, a, like the entire query is about three minutes. So we really did spend a lot of time, we would have spent a lot of time building those index pools. So that's not a good time there. So it does work in the where clause, but you do not get very good cardinality estimates. So if we run this query, um, it's pretty fast because I'm, I, I want it to be fast to, I don't re really need to return a lot of rows or do a lot of work. Uh, what I want to show here is um, if you have multiple calls to the function in the where clause, right? So in this case, the query is where total score by user is greater than or equal to 10,000 and where total score for a user is less than 20,000. So we're searching like people with pretty, like I guess like I'm like the lower side of scores uh, in Stack Overflow. But uh, if we look at this, what's gonna happen is we're actually gonna see uh, two calls to that function. Right, so if we if we didn't have this inline, SQL Server would be able to just do it all at once. But uh, when the function gets inline, SQL Server has to take that first call to the function to figure out what's greater than or equal to ten thousand, and then it also has to make a second call to the function to figure out what's less than twenty thousand. So it can add some like in this case, it's not a complete performance disaster. I don't want it to be a performance disaster here. I just want to show you the behavior. Uh, let's see. Do you think there are uh, costs to have the most beautiful query contest contests to have the most beautiful query plan uh, maybe but I'll tell you um, Microsoft would have some work to do before we called any of this stuff beautiful that's <laughs> it's all you know what here's the thing inside they're ugly inside they're ugly right inside this is what query plans are query plans are all ugly on the inside, right? It's all this XML. So it doesn't matter how pretty this stuff is. It's because it, it's, it's ugly on the inside. <laughs> Not like me, I'm beautiful inside. <laughs> At least, uh, yeah, leave that one alone. So uh, one way you can solve 
that problem with inlining is to uh, only have one call out to the function. So what we're going to do is we're going to cross supply the function as a values clause, and then we're just going and we're going to say alias, you know, whatever as t, and have that score column come out, and then we're just going to filter on score down here. And I'll show you the difference in the execution plan for this one. Is that it's a little bit quicker, and it's a little bit quicker because we only have one call out to uh, to generate the score, and then we just filter on what the results of that were. So yes, they work in the where clause, but if you have every, every, like if you have a reference to them in the where clause, then um, you know if you have multiple rather if you have multiple references to them in the where clause, things can get kind of ugly in the execution plan. And the other thing is that uh, you know if you uh, are counting uh, so like even with like, like with inlining or without inlining, it almost doesn't matter. You're going to end up with a crappy cardinality estimate from having that function in the where clause. So I would really, really, really um, just you know warn against doing that and expecting performance to magically get fantastically better. Um, you know you could still end up with you know pretty lousy execution plans because of the bad estimates that you get from functions in there. So uh, you know, and the the function that we started messing with earlier, right? So that one that uh, runs a top one query, uh, which is our one of our best friends. Uh, this function here, this is another example of a function that can end up with a pretty gnarly spool in it. So we're gonna go. So we're, with it, what this function is gonna do is go out and hit the badges table to get someone's most recent badge. So uh, just one simple return statement: select top one from badges. Uh, correlated on user ID, order by date descending. And what happens if we run this <coughs> in compat level 140, uh, we will get, at least, from, at least from what I recall, is at least a reasonably fast query. You know, um, a lot of people are sort of surprised when functions aren't less like constantly just like like the like this 10 minutes of running into your performance world but this function does run for um let's call it just about two seconds we have about 275 milliseconds up until we hit the compute scalar and then on the compute scalar we spend i don't know just like a just about two seconds within that and this is going to be where that function is uh is uh, being called. So this last badge function in the select list is just right there. And of course, if we set this to compat level 150, now remember, this takes two seconds, right? If we set the database to compat level 150 and we rerun this, we may notice a slight performance degradation. And we are going to notice a slight performance degradation for uh, at least what I think is a pretty familiar reason. If you've been hanging out watching, um, watching me talk about SQL Server, uh, we're going to hit Excuse me, mm, got something stuck in my throat. Uh, we're going to hit uh, another index spool issue, right? So we're going to hit hit a hit a query plan where SQL Server decides to create an, an index for us on the fly, and creating that index is, of course, uh, just about twenty five seconds worth. Well, actually, sorry about that. Uh, let's see, one and a half minus uh, about twenty three and a half seconds worth of work to build that spool. So this is this is like a pretty severe regression that might happen with Freud, but you know it really does depend on kind of, kind of on like what your uh, what your functions are getting up to and doing. I'm not going to spend a lot of time dwelling on the spool stuff because you can watch recordings from last week last week streams where I'll, I'll go into great detail on them. But if we add the index that SQL Server was spooling to, we get back to having a pretty fast query plan. And that'll be pretty fast kind of regardless of what um, what compat level we're in for this, just because it's a pretty simple query. But you know, there is a difference here where, you know, in compat level 150, we get some we get we get a little more honesty from SQL Server about exactly what work we're doing, because at least here we can see that we go out and touch that badges table. So if you are using column store, uh, and this is um, something that I learned from my, my good and dear friend, Joe Obish, and that he talks about and that I think is a fantastic, interesting thing. Um, and this can happen, uh, let's see, oh, there's a question. Does it cause issues that can't be fixed with an index? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yes, so... I would say absolutely yes, but a lot of those are bugs, and I don't want to present about bugs too much because bugs do get fixed, and I don't want people to watch this material in you know three, six, nine months, a year from now, 
hear about a bug that was present in something with UDF inlining today and, uh, you know, decide against SQL Server or decide not to inline functions, something like that because of an old bug that got fixed. And I, also, I don't want to spend a lot of time re-recording videos to add corrections in when bugs get fixed. Um, I like, you know, as little of that as possible. So it, it can cause issues uh, that can't be fixed with an index. Um, I've seen issues with incorrect results. I've seen issues with uh, permissions. I've seen, you know, a few different things. But at the end of the day, uh, really, they are, they are bugs that will get fixed eventually and it's probably not worth our time talking about those bugs today because you know later on when as as you know the feature matures and those bugs are no longer present well you know it's gonna look kind of silly <laughs> gonna look kind of silly talking about bugs right so here is uh, a query here's a query and this query is uh, going to do something kind of weird um, this is probably not the most common uh, uh, situation for a query like this, but a lot of times you might have reporting, you might, you might have like sort of like report config tables that might have like dates in them or like some other information. And you might use those report config tables to join off to other tables uh, as to like, you know, implement some report logic. This is kind of a take on that, just applied to the Stack Overflow database. It looks a little weird and funky, and I fully admit that. But what we have is an index on the users table uh, on a few columns that we're going to be using in this query. And then we have a like probably not probably not a non-clustered column store index that I would want to create just because it's on only two columns, but that's all I need for this demo. If I was going to get into the habit of creating non-clustered column store indexes on uh, on row store tables, I would probably want to have a lot more columns in them so that, you know, uh, if you were in the paging uh, demo that I did yesterday, you'd understand why. So like, you give the SQL Server some more options. So I got these two indexes created. And rather than run this query, which, which would take a while, uh, I'm just going to show you a pre-baked execution plan from it. And what happens is we have a nested loops join and on the inner side of the nested loops join, we have the scan of the column store index, which is pretty quick at just about 2.7 seconds. Where things take a long time is with this lazy table spool. So with SQL Server, just like kind of like taking something from the nested loops join, going into the lazy table spool, and then hitting, or then like, you know, deciding to go get data from the column store index, bring it back to refresh the spool, or to, to renew, like put new data in the spool or reuse data in the spool. So the column store index, well, the other thing that sucks about this is that on the inner side of nested loops, uh, we do not get batch mode on the column store index. We end up scanning the column store index in row mode, which also hurts performance. This is a product limitation where you do not get batch, mo you do not get batch mode even on column store uh, on the inner side of uh, these nested loops here. But uh, really, you know, the issue is, um, well, kind of something else, right? something a little bit different. Uh, so let's get out of this query plan. We don't need this thing anymore, right? We can get rid of that. And what we can do is create a scalar valued function that does the same thing that we just did up in the join, right? So we can take, we can get, a, we can select, we can get the sum from this post table where the score is between, uh, or rather where the last activity date is between uh, dates that will pass into the function, right? So let's create this. And let's set this to compat level 140. And we run this. And this comes back very quickly now. Remember that the, the previous version of this plan ran for about three minutes. Now, like even though this compute scalar is hiding the scalar valued function, right? It's hiding all the work that that scalar valued function did. Even though that's all hidden away in there, this can happen very quickly now. If we look at the estimated plan for this, right? Remember, we get the estimated plan so that we can see the, the execution plan for the scalar valued function. Now, right, when we hit this column store index, we will be able to do that in, oops, be able to do that in batch mode. So only inside of scalar UDFs can we get batch mode on the inner side of that nested loops there. Uh, if we set the database to compat level 150, we no longer get that. If we look at the estimated plan, we're going to see 
our old friend being back here, right? That that eager index spool, and the the fully well the pre baked execution plan for that. You can see that we spend two minutes building that spool on the inner side of the nested loops. That's no fun at all. Uh, and the, right now, the only way to fix that would be to alter the function to turn off inlining. So if we keep the if we keep the database in compat level 150, but we create that function with inlining turned off, we will get the we will get the good fast plan again. At least I, I think we will. Yeah, so that's not that's not too bad there, right? So something to be aware of if you are using column store that um, you know scalar UDF inlining can make uh, some things a little bit weird. So the last thing that I want to talk about with UDF inlining is what happens when we want to um, when we want to uh, get, generate multiple aggregates. Right, so what we're going to do is look at, we're going to, well, we get that index now. That's, that's, that's all straightened out. I'm happy with that. I'm happy with the way that index created. There's nothing wrong there. Right? Nothing wrong there. Everything is nice and happy with that index. But now let's, now this is something that I do see pretty frequently uh, with, um, with going on in scalar UDFs is having to, you know, generate some sums and averages, like, you know, aggregate some stuff. And if we run this and we look at the execution plan, this happens pretty quickly. And this all, and all of those things get aggregated within a single stream aggregate, right? All of those things happen just all at once. But if we go and stick that same logic inside of a scalar valued function, things are going to get a little bit more interesting. So just to show you, in compat level 140, right, if we run this query, right, we get this execution plan back. It happens pretty quick, right, about 500 milliseconds. And if we look at the execution plan, we will see just about the same thing that we saw with when we just ran the, the query on its own by itself, where we had an index seek, compute scale, R, stream aggregate. Everything happened pretty quickly. Everything went pretty well there. But when we flip the database into compat level 150, the execution plan is going to get a little bit more complicated. Oops, didn't mean to hit control. We hit F5. It's not, a, again, not a performance disaster. It takes about twice as long. But the execution plan also does a whole lot of weird stuff. So rather than handle all of those calculations in a single stream aggregate, we have to handle all of those calculations in separate stream, stream aggregates. So you can kind of see there from like looking at the body of the function, we have the count and then we have a, uh, two sums of, uh, of, uh, from the post table and then we have two averages from the post table. And for each one of those things, we will have an access of the post table. Right, so we have you know probably the count, the sum, a sum, an average, and another average. For every single every single aggreg aggregate that we have in that select list, we are going to have a separate access to the table. So depending on how good your indexing is, this could be either really really good or really really bad. Without an index on here, if I get rid of the index that I created to sort of help this query out, we would have five index pools in here that would be kind of a nightmare. Uh, so that's no fun either. But so you know, it's just something to be kind of aware of when you're uh, when you're switching over to 2019 and doing stuff with UDF inlining. Anyway, anyway, that that covers just about all the stuff that I wanted to, to talk about with UDF inlining. Um, you know, there are some there are some weird edge cases. A lot of them sort of have uh, similar outcomes, similar patterns. But it's the stuff that I think you're going to see most commonly. It's the stuff that you're you're going to have to wrestle with when you start dealing with uh, UDF inlining. Maybe you know, um, you know, maybe depending on how good your indexing is, how good your queries are, you won't run into it at all. Which I I hope you don't. But uh, you know, that is certainly something uh, to keep an eye on. Usually. Um, like f from like most of the, the queries that I've seen, the query plans that I've seen where there were big regressions with UDF inlining, there was, there was some kind of spool involved, whether it was index spool or a lazy table spool. So that's about it for what I wanted to show you. I'm going to head back over to the PowerPoint. And uh, just in case anyone, well, let's see, the rest of the deck over here is just kind of screen caps of the demo. So there's not really anything that I'm, I want to talk about over there. But if, um, if anyone has questions about anything that we talked about uh, or sort of general SQL Server questions, I'd be happy to hang out for a few and, you know, ask those. Um, I will be doing a stream, I think, tomorrow and Thursday to... Uh, 
you know, kind of just keep the keep the keep the streak alive, as they say. Uh, so I'll I'll try to pick out a different set of uh, different set of stuff to talk about tomorrow and Thursday. But then Friday I'm going to be teaching the class, so I won't I won't be doing a, a live stream. I think Thursday I'll probably do uh, an open Q and A thing. I'll I'll do that a little bit earlier since um, I think I have to think a little bit less for those sometimes sort of depending on the questions i guess but uh that, that's probably what i'll do thursday um but yeah i'll stick around for a little bit and if anyone has questions comments concerns anything sql server or apparently nutrition related we can certainly um can certainly uh talk over those uh let's see mike says is your average including zeros for post types not to be considered uh yeah i think they're in there i didn't it, it, i didn't spend a lot of time like working out like you know awesome logic for these things it, do, it doesn't really matter all i wanted to show you is what happens with multiple aggregates i mean for me i don't you know you, for me like you know you probably have to average in the zeros if you have a bunch of posts with zero score like i think you actually get badges for that so <laughs> if you're gonna get a you're gonna, if you're gonna get rewarded for it they need to get counted in when uh when 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 we're looking at your score averages. Also, I'm terrible at math, so <laughs> I don't, I don't, t I don't usually think about things like averaging in zeros. Sorry about that. I'm sorry if that breaks the demo for you. If that breaks the mystique of the demo. All right. Uh, give it another minute or so to see if any questions come in. I'm fine if they don't. If you have, if you all want to go do something else, I understand. It's hot out. <laughs> it's brutally hot out. You might just want to like get away from a screen or something. It's probably probably a good idea. You know what? I think I think I'm gonna do the same. I think I'm gonna get away from a screen too. So uh, thanks for joining. Um, I will see y'all tomorrow. We'll talk about something different. I'm not quite sure what yet, but we'll, we'll go ahead and figure that out. What will you be covering on Friday? Uh, a, a lot of performance tuning stuff. Advanced performance tuning, a full day of it. There are many, many subjects that will be covered. Uh, Jeremy, if I buy the premium performance tuning training, I will also get access to all the video training. Yes. Yes, you will. All of it, uh, you will get. Um, so I already sent out the attendee email for today, but if you, if you sign up tomorrow morning, I will, I will send out the, the, uh, I will send out another round of confirmation emails. So give folks a little bit today to sign up and then every morning, uh, so to every morning this week, so next Wednesday and Thursday, uh, I'll be sending out emails to any new attendees to be able to get the videos, get, make sure they have all the class logistics lined up and all that good stuff. So anyway, uh, thanks for joining. I will see you all tomorrow, and we will go hang out and do, I don't know, fun fun things. <laughs>